Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 12, and I'll be reading verses 12 through 19. And this is what it says. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king comes sitting on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. And so the multitude who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were bearing him witness. For this cause also the multitude went and met him, because they heard that he had performed this sign. The Pharisees therefore said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Pray with me. Lord, this day, make our eyes, make our ears, make our hearts attentive to your voice as you speak through worship. And may we... May we be changed by your presence. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was just about a week ago. Jesus and his disciples were beyond the Jordan. That's what the Bible says, beyond the Jordan. Now, we don't know exactly where beyond the Jordan was, but it's code. It's code for... They were in the boondocks. They were out in the middle of nowhere. Beyond the Jordan, it's like who knows where they were. That's when they received word that Lazarus was sick. Now, Lazarus lived in Bethany. And Bethany was only two miles from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was anything but the boondocks. That was the big city. Well, from the time they got traveled from the boondocks to Bethany where Lazarus lived... Lazarus wasn't sick anymore. He was dead. He'd been dead for four days. And that's when Lazarus' sister Martha unloaded on Jesus. She said, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And that's when Jesus went to the grave of his friend Lazarus. And that's where the Bible tells us Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the whole Bible, Jesus wept. And very well may be the most pastoral verse in the whole Bible. That in those two words, Jesus wept, it lets us know that, that your suffering, it matters to God. That your heartache matters to God. Your hardship, it matters to God. So much so that Jesus wept. But the Bible also tells us that isn't all Jesus did. That he asked for the, the stone to be rolled away from Lazarus' grave. And that's when Jesus shouted down death. He said, Lazarus, come out. And out walked Lazarus, four days dead in the grave, still in his grave wrappings. Now, you raise somebody who's been dead for four days, people are going to talk. 
Oh, word went out like wildfire. Everyone knew Jesus' name. They might not know the first disciple. They might not be able to recognize his face, but everyone knew his name. He had raised Lazarus four days dead from the grave. And after being dead for four days, I would guess that Lazarus was hungry too. So they had a party, big celebration, four days dead in the grave. And it was there at the celebration that Mary, Lazarus' other sister, came to Jesus and she broke over his head a vial of perfume and also put it on his, his feet. Now, this wasn't just sweet smell for date night. No, this was nard. And nard, nard was made to cover up the stench of death. This wasn't just a little whiff of perfume. This was the kind of perfume that would overpower the stench of death for days and days and days. So the next day, when Jesus and his disciples entered into Jerusalem, not only did the crowd know him by name, now the crowd knew him by sight and knew him by smell as well. As Jesus enters into Jerusalem on a donkey, they began to break off limbs of, of, of palm trees and wave them. Matthew tells us they began to put their clothes in the road. And they shouted, Hosanna. Now that word Hosanna, that doesn't, that's not another word for hooray or whoopee. Hosanna means save us. And then they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel, they were calling him king. As many as, well, oh, more than. It's estimated that more than two million people were, were crowded into Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And now they were gathered around him. As he's riding this donkey into Jerusalem, they're, they're gathered around him. Shouting that he's the king. That he's the king. Verse 16 tells us that these things the disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. Then they remembered that these things were written of him. And that they had done these things to him. Well, what did they remember? Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning. What did they remember when Jesus rose from the grave about these things? What was it that Jesus was pointing to in these things that happened? That's what I want to talk about this morning. What did they remember? Well, they remembered that Jesus has power over death. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Jesus has power over death. James Moore tells a story about a, a young husband who's buried his wife. He and their young son are coming from the, the cemetery when the questions start. The little boy says, Daddy, where is Mommy? When will Mommy be home? Where is she? And again and again and again, these innocent questions came out. And that's when the father did his best to answer them. And then again at night, the father tried to answer the questions he didn't want the boy to go into the night alone so he lay down with the little boy he did his best to answer the questions and that's when the little boy said daddy if you turn your face toward me i think i can go to sleep the father turned his face toward him and he could hear the little boy's breathing beginning to slow as he drifted off to sleep that's when the father whispered a prayer. He said, Oh God, the days in front of us are dark, and I don't understand them. But I know if you turn your face toward me, we'll get through. When Jesus was at the grave of his friend Lazarus, and he said, Lazarus, come out. When he shouted down death, he turned his face toward you and toward me. When Jesus, there on the cross, said, it is finished, he conquered death, he conquered sin once and for all, his work was, was finished, he turned his face toward you and toward me. When Jesus rose from the grave, 
And he turned to his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He turned his face toward you and toward me. That not only did, did he have the power over death, that when he breathed his spirit into his disciples then and as he breathes in his, his spirit into his disciples today, he gives you and me that power over death. That no longer does death have its sting. No longer are we to live under the, the, the power of sin and of death. That it's the power of the risen Christ that lives through, through you and through me. That's the power that Jesus gave. He gave it then and he gives it now. The disciples, they began to remember and understand these things when Jesus rose from the grave. They remembered, they understood that he has power over death and they remembered and understood that he has power through life. case could be made that the theme of the whole of the Bible is that word life. That God said it. God said, you have life and death before you, choose life. That when God, in Genesis chapter 2, breathed into Adam, he breathed into his nostrils. That's when the, the, the breath of life. And that's when Adam became a living being. When the, the breath of God, the Spirit of God was, was alive in Adam, that's when he became fully human. And when Jesus Christ rose from the grave, it says that he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. There in John chapter 20, he breathed on his disciples. Well, John wraps all this together in verse Chapter 20, verse 31, when he says, But these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That it's a new creation story. And you and me, we're a part of that new creation. Life, life with a capital L, life that's abundant, life that's eternal, life that's full. Because Jesus, the risen Christ, lives in us. We become a new creation. Earl Palmer wrote a little book called The Enormous Exception. In this little book, he, he talks about interviewing a, a young pre-med student from the University of California, Berkeley. This pre-med student has been through a long journey of doubt, of questioning, and then he became a Christian. Earl Palmer is, is asking him about that journey. And the young man tells him that the tipping point, the tipping point for him came when he was a, a pre-med student. It came the semester that he was sick. And for 10 days, he had to be at, 10 days straight, he had to be out of class. And during those 10 days, another student, without any fuss, without any fanfare, without complaining, he took notes. He took notes for him, and he would come back at the end of class, and he would tell him what the class was about, and he would study with him so he wouldn't fall behind in his classes. And that's when this young man goes on to say, says, this kind of thing just isn't done. I wanted to know what made this guy act the way he did. I even found myself asking if I could go to church with him. that that was the tipping point. The way he treated him, the way that he served him, without fanfare and without complaining. If, if you were the only Jesus that someone came across, would there be be enough there in your life to tip the scales? Would they be able to see the risen Christ? Would they be able to, to see a life that's different, that's abundant? A life that has purpose. A life of service. Would there be enough there to tip the scales? 
When Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me, he rose again to live his life through us. That we might have life, his life, full and abundant. A life, a life of service, of sacrifice. Not for for ourselves, but a life of service and sacrifice for God, for neighbor. The disciples remembered and understood, understood the things that went on that day, that they they understood that Jesus has power, power over death, power through life. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, that Jesus has the power of peace. Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem that day, not a stallion, not the animal of of conquest, of power, of, 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 of a king, of a conqueror. He rode a donkey. He didn't ride into Jerusalem to div- divide us and them and to fight the people who were there. That he rode in a donkey. And there he went to the cross. There he was crucified, and when he rose again on the third day, it tells us that he met the disciples behind closed doors, doors that were closed for fear, for fear. And his first words to his disciples were, peace be with you. The risen Christ, the first words to his disciples were, peace be with you in John 20, verse 19. Rollo May tells a a story in his book, My Quest for Beauty. He tells a story about visiting Mount Athos in Greece. This small peninsula is totally inhabited by by monks. And there on this this tiny peninsula, Mount Athos, Rollo May was trying to recover from a mental breakdown that he had had. And he was there during the the Greek Orthodox Easter festival. And there as they, they celebrated Easter, they celebrated with great beauty, with with a lot of symbols, with icons, with incense. And at the at the height of the service, the Greek Orthodox priest gave each person in attendance three beautifully decorated eggs. And then when he he uncovered the eggs to, to each of them. In Greek, he said, Christos Anesti, which means Christ is risen. And then, then each person, including Rolo, may responded back together, he is risen indeed. Now, it's a curious thing. It's a curious thing because Rolo May was not a believer. And Rolo May goes on to, to write, I was seized then by a moment of spiritual reality. What would it mean for our world if he truly had risen? What would it mean for our world if Jesus Christ had truly risen? He has risen. And what it does mean is that we have peace. There's no need to live in fear that we have have peace. On the last night of his earthly life, Jesus turned to his disciples in John 14, 27, and he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That Jesus has given you and me his peace. Today is the right day to take what he's given. That he's offered you and me peace. It's a peace that the Bible tells us passes all our comprehension because it's Jesus that stands guard of our our heart and our mind. Now fear, that's what the world offers. As a matter of fact, that's what's most natural in this world. And you don't have to get out of bed 
to receive the, the notices on our telephones that this is what you need to be afraid of today. You don't have to go beyond your television set. You don't have to go beyond the radio. You don't have to go beyond the, the fears that, that one person spreads to the other, to the next. Fear is the most natural thing. But Jesus didn't come to give us what's most natural. He came to give us His life. The life of, of the risen Christ, alive in you and me. And that life has, has power. The power of peace. Peace here in this life. Here in this day. This morning, it may be that You've heard that word before that Jesus offers peace, but it's elusive. I think so often we look at the Christian life as a smorgasbord and we just take what we want and we leave what behind what seems a little too hard or a little too difficult. That's not the life that Jesus offers you and me. When He died on the cross, He wiped away all those things that would destroy us, and when He rose from the grave, He rose to give us power power to receive a new life, a new creation, not just the pieces that we want, a power where you and I can, can love God and serve Him with, well, the way He puts it, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, all of us, and we serve our neighbor as ourselves. Well, that, that's a part that sometimes I think if, 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 if Christianity is a smorgasbord, that's a piece we'd rather leave behind. And there may be pieces of your life that you've, you've kept closed off. That you've, you've wanted to take the, the good parts and leave behind the hard parts. But this morning, the risen Christ has given you a nudge. Maybe even given you a shake. That that part of your life that you've tried to wall off has been a, a place of worry. It's been of anything but, but peace. It's been a place of fear. And this morning, you want to invite the risen Christ to live there. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you this morning. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, this day, it's a time of worship where, where you join our spirits with your spirit. And may we receive the peace that you offer. Not as if that's, that's just one little piece, but the whole of the Christian life. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we may begin to, to open up those places that we've tried to wall off from you. Yes. Maybe we've been withholding worry. As if we could do something about it. And it keeps us busy as if, if it made a difference, but it doesn't. Instead, what it does is, is it defeats us and keeps us anxious. Or maybe there's a part of our lives that we've tried to keep walled off from you. A behavior that we haven't wanted to give up. That we've wanted to, to keep this Christian life a smorgasbord where we take the good parts and, well... We don't want to give over our behavior to you. Or there may be a room, a place within us where we wanted to withhold forgiveness. A room of unforgiveness where maybe we rehearse how we've been hurt and the things that are unforgivable in our lives. That's not the life that you offered us. You offered us a life of power. Yes, over death. Yes, through life. And yes, the power of peace. And that life comes when you live your life through the whole of us. Lord, this day, with your power, enter into that, that room, that place in our hearts that we've tried to keep walled off from you. And may we hear your word of peace. and be made into a new creature. 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.